Um, thank you very much. Um, nevertheless, I should start with thanks to the organizers of this uh, great program, Anat, and uh, all the other people who uh, were uh, collaborating on this. Um, now, I, I want to really thank you about uh, the great paper, I, I, which stimulates my thought in, in my reactions on various levels. I think it's a very thoughtful analysis. And uh, I, want, I would like to start with, uh, with a question. Um, um, and that is, what, what lesson can we learn from this analysis to the general relations between law and art, as you were trying to summarize and conclude in your concluding remarks. Now, I think the problem is, is that perhaps you are talking about examples which do not represent pure examples either of law and art. Right? Halakha, well, it, it, perhaps you could treat it as type of law, Obviously, there is some legal aspect in halakha, but it's not the pure example. It's not the prototype of law, on the one, on the one hand, nor the um, liturgical prayer during high holy days is a pure example of art. Nevertheless, I still think that your analysis could teach us a great lesson about the general uh, abstract understandings of the relations between law and art. Though I think there, there's another aspect which was, un, was not addressed on your paper, and I think it should be mentioned. Perhaps it's too important to be explicitly addressed, but, and that is, um, that is the, the, the notion or the concept of the realm of the sacred. So I, I would even argue that this is the elephant within the room. I think we are talking here about the sacred. We are talking here about, well, it's not only the distinction, it's not only the topographical distinction between Broadway and Brooklyn. It's absolutely, as you mentioned, the distinction between a play on, on Broadway, uh, uh, on, on the Broadway, but and the synagogue, on the other hand within the context of the liturgy of the high holiday. So I think that what we have here, at least what I felt, what I drew from your paper is that we have here the triangle scheme of, on the one hand, the law, the art, and the sacred. Now I want to say a few words about the interplay between these three angles. Now I won't address the interplay between law and the sacred, uh, sorry, between the sacred and the art. This is a wide, broad issue. It has to do a lot with theological concerns. If you think about idolatry, about iconoclasm, about iconography on the one hand, about representing the unrepresentable. So I won't touch on that, but I do want to say a few things about the low art interplay and the low and the sacred. And thinking about low and art, I think the first thing that recalled my mind is the item uh, that we see in the first article in Justinian Digest, where he says, Jus est ars boni et equi, namely, the law is the art of goodness and equity. Then one must ask himself, in what sense is law the art of goodness and equity? Or what kind of art? And I think you correctly made a point that we should distinguish between so to say, pre-modern perception of art, mainly the mimetic perception of art, that art is to, to imitate something out there, and the modern perception of art, which you termed the site-specific, but it could also be time-specific and person-specific, it's, it's very particular. In that respect, I do see how the liturgical prayer and the law are fitting into the scheme. Now, um, according to the mythic, mimetic perception of art, the aim of art is to capture or to eternalize the temporal moment, the concrete, the spontaneous, in diametrical opposition to the site-specific perception of art. 
Now, in that respect, I do see and I do understand, actually, I do a better understanding of the refusal of um, uh, Cantor Rosenblatt and uh, Rav Tau to repeat or to recite the liturgy outside the synagogue and in another context than the High Holy Days. Because the law, in one sense, is something that it is by essence repeatable. If you just think about the ideal of the rule of law, some, some <coughs> really emphasize this feature of the ideal of the rule of law that it is blinded towards particular events and particular circumstances, particular people. You can just imagine decay, the goddess of justice since Renaissance times, which her eyes are covered because part of the ideal of the rule of law is actually not to take into account the site-specific, the time-specific, the person-specific circumstances. You could also find reference to these perceptions in Maimonides' legal thought in the very famous chapter in the guide. I think it's part, it's part 335 or 34, where he says that the law refers only to the majority of events, al harov, but the law is not observing or maybe the law is not viewing the particular case. So in the one hand, I think it absolutely fits to the drama that you uh, described as that there is something in the law that cannot, ca that cannot go along with the spontaneous moment of the art. In this case, it's the liturgy. Now I want to bring also some other further examples that might uh, pick on that distinction the, between the repeatable and the unrepeatable. Uh, one, one, I think one, one, uh, one articulation of this distinction which could be later thought of is the way the distinction between oral law and unwritten law is described by one of the late Geonites, uh, towards the late 10th century, Rav Sharira Gaon where he is trying to account on the distinction between oral law and written law in a very different way. He's saying that written law obviously is the law that is written, but oral law is not simply the unwritten law, as we might think that when, like the Greeks, when they use the grapus and agrapus, the, the written law and the unwritten law, but he says that the oral law is by definition something that cannot be formulated to be written, right? And he actually emphasizes the very same thing, that oral law is something that it is a content which you could only transmit by site-specific and person-specific and time-specific. Kerab HaMelamed Talmid, as a master who teaches his disciple, but it's not something that just by, accid by, that, uh, that by accident was not formulated and, and put on the scripts, but something that cannot by, by principle be uh, by be, uh, be written down. Also, I recall the distinction that uh, Giorgio Agamben says about the passage from the phoné to the logos, of course brought up by Heidegger initially, but actually he's talking about the pre-lingual situation where something cannot be captured in words and cannot be formulated in reason, and that might be also the place of art vis-a-vis -vis the law. Now I want to move to the, I think, the most fascinating aspect in your paper, at least fascinated me, and that is the relations between the law and the sacred, right? Um, and I think your paper illustrates the problem in many ways. Uh, in many ways, this relation is also acting to the relations between law and art. Now, I think it's, it's very interesting that the case, the test case that you brought us was the prayer of the Day of Entonement. Obviously, the Day of Entonement is not only taken as the Day of Entonement, but also as the Day of Trail, Yom Hadin. In that respect, we see that the liturgy is, in a way, also imitating court or imitating trail. Now, now we ask ourselves, in what way does liturgy imitate that scene? Moreover, if you think about the very same uh, poet you mentioned, Untanet uh, Tokif, uh, uh, which actually empowers the image of the sacred day as the, 
facing trail, then we could also, I think, come up with some observations about how the sacred activity is imitating legal activity. So first thing I'm gonna say that there is some mixture, a mix up of images. We refer to God as our Lord and our Father, Avinu Malkeinu. Well, it's not clear while you facing trail, you could sit in front of your father and to be judged by. More than that, we are sometimes be called the judge. Don't forget that you are our father, therefore you should actually deviate the fixed law and take into circumstances our, our love, our relationships, and so on. So in one way, we, we could also see the prayer of the high holidays as a way to bribe the judge to actually play being in a court on the one hand, on the other hand, actually trying to dismantle this situation, this scene as of, of being in trail. So I think that what could be said about this analogy that this mimetic relations or the imitation of the legal scene is not, is not complete. And more than that, it's in a way that we struggle with the images, we stretch the images, we examine the borders or the limits of these images, and we actually make ourselves confused. If you think about taking seriously the circumstances of facing a trail, how could you understand that we are trying to confuse the prosecutor by blowing the shofar, right, the horns? So I think what we have here, if we compare the law and the sacred in that respect, I think that within the sacred activity of the liturgy, we are struggling with the image of the law. We are reflecting, we are reacting to the image of law. We say something about the image of the law because if you just think about it, we couldn't really survive if we go to a real trail. We will not be, will not be able to be um, to be innocent in that procedure. So I think what we see here, I think it is again, it's the interplay between the legal praxis and the sacred relations to the deity drawing from, from the legal uh, realm and in fact confusing not only the prosecutor, the Satan, but also confusing ourselves in that event. And I think that confusion has a very important existential uh, uh, um, significance um, as part of the uh, sacred activity, but uh, uh, I think I will just stop here. Thank you very much.